Good morning, everyone. It's great to see everyone in the house of the Lord this morning. And for those that are joining us online, we want to welcome you as well. Before we enter into this time of worship, I think it's important for us to remember the truth the Bible teaches us about who God is. We see in Psalm 145, verse 13, it says, Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises and faithful in all that he does. The Lord upholds all who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. The Lord is righteous in all of his ways and faithful in all he does. The Lord is near to all who call to him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cry and saves them. The Lord watches over all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. This psalm reminds us that the Lord is loving to all he has made. That the Lord upholds, that he lifts up, that he satisfies, that he is near and that he watches over us. It's good news for us. Lord, we are so thankful that you care so deeply for us, that you lift us up, that you find pleasure in having made us. And if you're willing and able this morning, let's just pray to the Lord and thank him for who he is and what he's doing. If you'll stand with me. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the words of the psalmist, that you are loving to all that you've made, that you uphold, that you lift up, that you satisfy, that you watch over us, Lord. And God, we know that you're watching over our assembly this morning. God, we want this to be a time of true worship, of authentic expression of our love for you, thanking you for the love that you've so freely lavished upon us. God, we want to remember who you are. We want to keep our minds and our hearts focused on what your word tells us about your character, about your person, Lord. You are so good. You bless us so much every day. And Lord, we don't want to take for granted any blessing that you have bestowed upon us, Lord. We don't want to take for granted the amazing gift that we received in salvation. But we want to be aware of your presence in this place this morning. We thank you that you do watch over us, that you love us, that you care about us, that you promised us that we could cast our cares upon you because you care for us, Lord. And we thank you that we can join together this day, the day that you have made, this glorious day, and sing of your name, that we can lift up your name, the name above all names, that we can exalt you in this place together as a congregation, as a family, as the body of Christ. And that we can give you everything that we have in us. Because you are so worthy of it. And everything that we have, we've been given by you. Thank you, Lord, for showing up here. Thank you for being here. Thank you for inhabiting the prayers and the praise of your people. Lord, we give you this service today. And every word that is spoken, every song that is sung, let it be for your honor and glory and let your will be done here. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> you ready to worship the Lord this morning? I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb 
Till I met you I was breathing But not Alive And all my failures I tried To hide It was my turn Till I met you some help. Landon, can you help me out? Can you just hold that and look adorable? Thank you. Abs, can you hand that? I'm going to hand this over here. Zach or one of you guys, can you hold that? That's free advertising from a happy camp while we're sitting here. Um, so here's the question I have, and this is a question that um, I'd like to throw out to you all this morning is, do you think that Jesus ever got into trouble? You don't think? No. no. He never you sinned. You do? He never sinned? I mean, but think about this, right? He was, fully, he was fully God, but he was also fully human. So I'm going to play devil's advocate here a little bit. So because he was fully human, do you think he ever got mad enough at his brother where he wanted to, you know, kick him in the shin or something like that? Do you think he ever, do you think that he ever got, like as he walked through the kitchen area when Mary said, don't touch that? He took it and ate it? No. You know, like the empty, the open bag of marshmallows at my house that just seemed to disappear <laughs> magically? 
you know? No. No. It doesn't stand. Well, I have a, you. but I, like, if I have a cookie jar full of cookies, and they're just like, eat me, eat me, you know, maybe, I don't know, that'd be a big temptation, wouldn't it? But I think about, you know, you think about it. One of the cool things about the Bible is that it tells us a lot about Jesus's life. It, it doesn't tell us everything, but it tells us what we really need to know, if that makes sense. And one of the things that Isaiah wrote, and you're spot on, by the way, good job, is in Isaiah chapter 53, the, the back half of verse 9 says that Jesus did no violence, nor was there any kind of deceit in his mouth. So he did not lash out in sin. He didn't lash out in violence. He didn't have deceit. He didn't lie. He didn't gossip. He didn't do those <laughs> things that all of us struggle with, if, if we're honest. And it, unfortunately, Cooper doesn't go away either. It's something that we battle with as we grow up too. So in thinking about that, can you guys hold up your shirts for a second? So that way we can see. So when we think about the life span of Jesus, right? Now I know it's a pink shirt. I don't know that Jesus wore a pink shirt, but it's what I had at home to help you guys <laughs> capture this idea. Regardless of your age, whether you're little medium size, or even grown-up size, this is something that we get tempted with. But fortunately for us, let me put the shirts down now, fortunately for us, Jesus did not sin. Jesus was perfect. And the Apostle Paul tells us that in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says that God made him, meaning Jesus, God had no sin to be sin for us, for people like Ursula, and people like Wesley and Landon and Micah and Jess and Josh and Steve and Laurel and Tim. So that in him, in Christ, we might become the righteousness of God. So fortunately for us, we have Jesus who was perfect. He did not lash out in sin. He was the perfect spotless lamb. And because of that, because he was fully human too, he can show us empathy. He can look at us with mercy and say, I know what that felt like, but I didn't screw up. And he can show us that mercy and love for us. Guys, I'd like to pray with you and then I'm going to send you on your way. So if you would, will you pray with me, please? Yes. Sweet. Here we go. <laughs> Lord God, we thank you for everything that you are, that your word tells us you are, that you committed no sin. You had no deceit in your mouth. You were not violent in a way that we would classify as sinful. Instead, you were blameless, perfect, the epitome of love. So God, when we mess up and we sin against you or we harm other people, God, we can look to you for forgiveness, knowing that you are the perfect lamb who takes away our sin. God, as we move from here, we ask God that you would just uh, empower us to make good choices and to lead us um, by your spirit. Lord God, we love you and we thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Now, because most of you didn't try and steal my cookies when my eyes were closed, <laughs> I'll hook you guys up with some sugar. Here you go. Here you go. Have a great day, guys. You're out of here. stand with me this morning. You know what I love about this morning? It seems like so many things have kind of gone off the rails in our eyes. But you can feel God's presence here. And it just reminds us that God uses imperfect people to do his will. You know, we have things that feel like it derails our day. And they're such minor inconveniences. But God loves us through all of those things. And it just reminds us how much we need him. 
because we're so fickle in our emotions that we can get off track even when things aren't really that big of a deal. But this song, Lord, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness, how I need you. That's what it's all about. What Donna said about the shoeboxes, about how they reach these children for Christ. About Josh's message this morning, about that perfect Savior. That's what it's all about. It's not about these minor inconveniences. It's not about our fickle emotions, but it's about resting in who Jesus is. And as we sing this song, let's just keep that in mind. How much we need Jesus every hour, every minute, every second. And Lord, we thank you that you're here this morning. You are a good, good father and we worship you, Jesus. Let's just lift his name this morning. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one difference, my righteousness. Oh God, how I need you. Where sin runs deep, your grace is more. Where grace is found, is where you
Let us pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning yes, God. to worship you, Lord. Let us be here with grateful hearts, Lord, to not desire the things that the world tells us we need, to not look for the things in this life, the easy way, the, the, uh, just the way that, that they would tell us that we need to live, Lord, but let us be grateful for the things that you give us. Let our faith be strong enough that when we are struggling through tough times, that we know that you have us right where we need to be for our journey with you, that we will grow through the struggles and through those times to enjoy the good times, Lord, even more so. Thank you, Jesus. I pray this morning, Lord, as we are at the very edge of what we call the holiday season this year, Lord, that we would be grateful for everything that we have, everything that you have given us, that by our faith in you, Lord, we, we are successful in this world, not monetarily, not by what we own, but, what we, but by what we have in our hearts. As we celebrate you this year, Lord, let us lift you high, very high. I ask you, this, Lord, to be with us and, and guide us as we go. I pray that you be with the message that is to be brought before us this morning, Lord, that we would open our hearts and hear what you have to say to us through Pastor Steve. Thank you, Lord, for the many blessings that you have given us. In Jesus' name, amen. So Exodus chapter 20, verse 14 is where we're going to be. There's a Bible app event for this message. This message is about a sensitive topic. And... Uh, hmm. It might kind of hit home in places you don't expect that it would hit home. It can be a sensitive topic because sometimes it's sensitive to people who have found themselves burned by adultery in their marriage. Their spouse was unfaithful to them. I would guess we have people here right now who have dealt with that. And that can be a very hurtful thing. All of us remember what it was like to be in junior high and to have that person, we thought, yeah, and it lasted for all of a week, and that just broke our hearts with that kind of breakup. It's significant, even if it's just a high school crush. But when it is a spouse, when it is someone who has pledged their life to you for better or for worse, for richer or poorer, and pledged their trust to you, it's much harder. So I would say to those of you who are here that if you find yourself in that position, I understand how sensitive this might be. In fact, if that is you, if you are someone whose spouse was unfaithful to you, I have words that I want to say to you very clearly. Never let the sinful behavior of another person define you. Let God define you. If you're a man, as a man. If you're a woman, let him define you as a woman. Let him define you as a human being and look to his faithfulness. There are other people who find this to be a sensitive issue because they've committed adultery. They have been adulterous. And maybe it was full-blown adultery and you're dealing with the guilt and shame of that. Maybe it was emotional adultery. Some people may feel like, well, that's no big deal. It was just emotional adultery. But you know that you made a connection that was over the line. And you're dealing with the guilt and the shame of that. Or maybe it just wasn't acted out. It was what we might think of as an affair of the mind. And strangely, you feel a sense of guilt and shame. And Jesus' words when he says, but I tell you the truth... Anyone who looks at a wo woman lustfully has already committed adultery in their heart. You're like, yeah, I get that. Let me say these words to you. Never let your past define you. Run to the God who is always able to forgive. Let hope define you. And lean hard into the power of the Spirit of God who, if you belong to Jesus, inhabits your very person 
Leave your past failings at the cross of Christ and walk in the forgiveness and newness of life that you've received from Christ. So yeah, this is a sensitive topic. Maybe that's why uh, we had all the little glitches this morning because it's hard to focus your mind after all that. It's hard to focus my mind. And maybe the enemy doesn't want you to deal with this. My hope is that as we deal with this important topic, you will be glad we had this time together, that you will feel like this was helpful to you personally. Adultery. It's one of the Ten Commandments. It's right here in number seven. It says, you shall not commit adultery in verse 14 of chapter 20 of Exodus. That's it. Small passage. Big deal. It is a big deal. Adultery, what, what does that really mean? And you can think of it in some very specific terms. You can think of the concept of adultery as a man having physical intimacy with a woman who is another man's wife. And that would be a very specific understanding of it. But in more general terms, you can understand that adultery is intimacy that violates the wedding vows. The wedding vows say implicitly or explicitly Something like this, forsaking all others, I take you. I will be faithful to you and you alone. I pledge myself to thee alone. I promise my true fidelity. I pledge my faithfulness. I give myself to you alone. Adultery is a violation of that promise, of that wedding vow. The Bible tells us that marriage is really something that is to be respected more than that. In fact, when you're reading through the New Testament and you're in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4, it says that marriage should be honored by all. And the marriage bed kept pure for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Think about those words about honoring marriage. Marriage should be honored. It should be treated with respect. It should even be revered. Marriage, that's a pretty serious thing. And it's to be honored not just by people who are married, but by people who are not married. By It should be honored by all. Honor. Being faithful in marriage is a matter of honor. And you may be thinking, how does that play out, this issue of honoring marriage? Does that mean I salute when marriage goes by in the parade? How do I honor marriage? I want to give you some counsel on that. And the first thing that I would like to ask you to consider is in honoring marriage to choose to respect marital intimacy. Now, when I say marital intimacy, I mean physical intimacy, but I mean more than physical intimacy. Because marital covenant, the marital love, the marital relationship, it's not just limited to physical intimacy. Strangely enough, it is deeper than that. <clears throat> marital fidelity is actually bigger than physical fidelity. This is so evident that I know pastors who have never been physically intimate with anyone except their spouse but they have been disqualified from ministry because of what was labeled an emotional affair. This happened to a friend of mine. He's in a different denomination. The, denomina the denominational leadership came to him and said, you have disqualified yourself for ministry because of an emotional relationship you had with another man's wife. Now, naturally, his response was, wait, <laughs> We haven't even held hands. Yes, they said, we know. But you have had marital intimacy, emotional intimacy with another man's wife. Interesting, sad, weird, scary. My friend was removed from his church. Now, you may disagree with that denomination's decision I honestly don't know what to think of it. But I do believe this, that adultery is not always a physical issue. Because of that, I want to 
choose personally to respect marital intimacy, all kinds of marital intimacy, and not enter into that with another man's wife, so to speak. In order to be faithful, I choose to respect marital intimacy, and I choose to respect the marital promise, the vows. I respect the vows that I made in my wedding ceremony, and I respect the vows that you made in your wedding ceremony. I will not, val- I will not violate yours, and you will not violate mine. That's respecting the marital promise. Technically, marriage vows can be really short. This is kind of comical. I heard of a a wedding where the marriage vows were incredibly short. I've shared this in other contexts. I share it in premarital counseling. That the, the gentleman, the groom, didn't want to be on the platform. And he said, short and sweet, pastor, short and sweet. And so he got up and the pastor looked at the groom and he said, take her. And he looked at the bride and he said, take them. And then he looked at the two of them and he said, took. (laughs) And that was the end of the wedding. I don't do that in, in wedding ceremonies. When I conduct a ceremony, there's some redundancy there and it's there for a purpose. There are actually three times when I have the couple speak their promise. When they arrive. Usually, when they arrive, the bride is standing down there. Her, uh, maybe her father, grandfather, another person has brought her to that point. The groom is standing here, and I'm standing over there. And while they're still apart, I ask each of them, I say to the man, do you take this woman here present to be your wedded wife? Is it in your intention to do so? And then I say to the woman, do you intend to take this man here present to be your wedded husband? And in each case, I require that they say, I do. And when they stand on the platform facing one another, staring vacantly into one another's eyes, as they're standing there, either reciting their wedding vows or replying to vows, they deal with words like these, forsaking all others, I take you to be mine until death do us part. That's twice. And now it's time to exchange the rings. And when they exchange the rings, there's a third acclamation of their vows. With this ring, I thee wed, and I do promise to keep myself to thee and thee alone. And when all is said and done at the end of the wedding ceremony, one of my favorite lines is this. What God has joined together, let no one put asunder. Let no one separate. It's redundant, but the redundancy is intentional because I want them to know and I want those looking on to know they have made a promise. They have made a covenant, a covenant and a promise that it would be wrong to break. And knowing, uh, keeping this commandment means honoring those vows. Keeping this commandment, honoring marriage means choosing to honor the purpose of marriage, the marital purpose, because marriage has a purpose that's important. Number one, it includes lifelong companionship. It is good for the man not to be alone. God said that, but marriage is bigger than that. Marriage includes procreation, be fruitful and multiply, but marriage is bigger than that. The purpose of marriage and uh, the huge purpose of marriage is you have opportunity to reflect God's likeness in a way that without marriage, you could not reflect it. That's why the creation account says, let us make mankind in our image. Do you catch the plural there? It's us, God says, make mankind in our image. This is a triune God speaking. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, having a conversation. And by the way, they love one another. Part of that image is that love. We know they love one another because at one point in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, I love the Father, and the Father loves me. I'm so thankful for that glimpse into the pure and holy and personal and faithful love in the triune God. So in creation... When God made humankind in their image, if I can say that, 
(laughs) He intended that Adam and Eve reflect that love, that purity, that commitment, that faithfulness that we find in the Godhead. The love that exists between a husband and wife has the honor of imaging the triune God. It is part of the purpose for marriage. Additionally, marriage reflects the relationship that Jesus has with his church. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, Ephesians 5.25 says. It's that children's song. I am the church. You are the church. We are the church together. What, we got no Methodists here? Yeah. The church is not a building. The church is not a steeple. The church is not a resting place. The church is the people. It's you and me. And so when scripture says, husband, love your wives as Christ loved the church, he's not talking about an organization or a corporation or a building. He is talking about human beings whom he has redeemed from death. And the loving relationship that Jesus has with them is something that's reflected in marriage. We want to honor that marital purpose, that our marriages would demonstrate the love that Jesus has with the church and the love that the church has for Jesus. And there is great benefit to this. There is great blessing in this. If you want to follow along in your Bible, go to Proverbs 5. We're going to be looking uh, at Proverbs 5 and Proverbs 7, just a few verses there. And chances are I'll have these verses on the screen. The verses we're going to look at are going to present this in male language, from a male perspective, applied to a male situation. And here's why. (laughs) These words are Solomon's words to his son. It's a dad writing to his son. The Bible tells us that King Solomon was the wisest man who ever lived, and he's writing a note. Hey, buddy, pay attention. This is important stuff for a little boy to know as he grows into a man. And as God would have it, we are actually privileged to kind of look over Solomon's shoulder as he writes. And so uh, we don't know what he said to his daughters. (laughs) We don't have that. But we have this, what he said to his son. And so it's pretty male-focused. And we find these words in Scripture, and we see these are actually being from God to us. So uh, the words here, to some modern minds, may seem sexist, but they're not. Because remember, we're just reading someone else's mail. We're reading this letter sent to a son, these words sent to a son. We're peering at wisdom that really transcends gender, because wisdom is wisdom. And it applies to men and women alike. And one of the first things I want you to see as far as these benefits, these blessings of honoring marriage is that honoring marriage brings satisfaction. It actually prevents that ungodly hunger found in lust. And lust has no end. That hunger grows and goes and grows and goes until the grave if you do not have it in check, and it never, ever satisfies. Never satisfies. That's why you keep going back. It is emptiness, and it brings emptiness. Proverbs chapter 5, verse 1, Solomon says to his son, My son, pay attention to my wisdom and turn your ear to my words of insight that you might maintain discretion and that your lips may preserve knowledge for the lips of an adulterous woman, drip honey, and her speech is smoother than oil. Okay, now let me restate this. I feel sure if we were reading Solomon's mail to his daughters, the counsel, the wisdom given, would be different, but it would be similarly applicable. So look at verse 3 again there. It says, For the lips of an adulterous woman drip honey, and her speech is smoother than oil. Do you hear in there the tone of seductiveness, the hint of seductiveness? It's like Sade singing, smooth operator. I think I sound like her, smooth operator. I do. I I think I sound like her. 
It's spelled out more clearly in chapter 7, verse 21, where it says, with persuasive words, she led him astray. She seduced him with her smooth talk. Seductiveness. In 1980 or so, I came home from the university on a Friday evening, and there in the driveway, my dad had purchased a 1977 Dodge Charger Daytona. Oh, yeah. Now, the Dodge Charger at that point in time, up until that point in time, had been an epic muscle car. It had been awesome. Particularly from 68 to 70, my brother actually had a 69 Dodge Charger, and I'll tell you what, if you don't think that's beautiful, you have no eye for beauty. <laughs> the car was absolutely fantastic, and I can't imagine. Bo, what's that car worth sitting on the screen there? Yeah, Bo doesn't have enough fingers to show me. <laughs> yeah. It was beautiful, that 69 Charger. Great car. But by the late 70s, the Charger line actually had one foot in the grave. And Dad's Charger was basically a Chrysler Cordoba with a nice paint job. That's what it came down to. And driving it proved it. It was not all that. You punch it and it would go, uh, uh, like that, that hesitation, you know? And, and, and then it lurched going around the corners, you know, like that. Did you ever drive a car that's kind of hopping around that corner? It did that. And, and, and then you, you couldn't even squeal the tires, not that I tried. But the only way to squeal the tires was to cut, cut it sharp to the left or right and then, you know, hit it hard. And, and that would let that one tire come up a little bit and you could get some, yeah, you could do that. And what dad would tell you and what I would tell you as well is that we had been seduced. We had been seduced by the name Dodge Charger Daytona. Scammed. Seduced. And absolutely not satisfied. That was Friday. Monday, my dad drove back to the dealership and traded it on a different car <laughs> because he was completely dissatisfied. What do we call that? Buyer's remorse, right? You call that buyer's remorse. When you have been seduced, scammed by adultery, you have a different kind of remorse. Adultery may seem like a good deal. That man may seem like the person you want because he's so understanding and he's such a good communicator and he takes time with you. Or that woman may seem like exactly what you want because have you seen her? She is all that. But that seduction will drain you. It will leave you empty because adultery is a scam. It is a lie. Look again. At Proverbs 5, verse 4. But in the end, she is bitter as gall, sharp as a double-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps lead straight to the grave. Hmm. I don't want that. I want a real thing. And we honor marriage because we know the emptiness and dissatisfaction that comes with adultery. It, it leaves us empty. But marriage, being devoted to that one person, that brings a sense of satisfaction that is difficult to understand, let alone explain. This morning, I get up at 6.30. I set my alarm on my phone for 6.29 because it just buzzes, and that doesn't wake the person next to me up. But I have the radio as a backup because I'm kind of a pants and suspenders, I mean, a belt and suspenders kind of guy, right? I need both those things. But then I turn the radio off. Some of you don't even know what that means. It's an old-fashioned alarm because I don't trust the phone. I turn the radio off so as not to wake up the person I love. I go and go through my morning routine, and I go downstairs, and I practice my sermon. At 7 o'clock, my wife comes down, still in her pajamas, and she says, do you want anything for breakfast? How's your coffee? Are you ready to go? And as I'm walking out the door, she did it again this morning, I'm walking out the door, and this, this person who's just fresh out of bed, whose hair looks like she's been sleeping in it all night, in her pajamas, comes over and kisses me softly on the lips and says, have a good morning. And I want to tell you, there is such a sense of fulfillment and satisfaction satisfaction and joy and completeness in that, that I can't explain it to you. I cannot explain it to you. It is a beautiful thing. And that is why we honor marriage. 
because it brings satisfaction that adultery could never hope to. Hmm. Honor and marriage strengthens our relationships, all of our relationships, because it increases your trustworthiness. There are certain things, sorry, there are certain things that Laurel and I never joke about. We never joke about leaving one another. We never joke about adultery. We never even talk about divorce as though it were something we would consider. We want those things never to seem like they're trivial or even possible, let alone humorous. We want to foster trust. Years ago, I read a story in a book um, about a guy who was giving a seminar, I think it was on the Oregon coast, uh, looking out of the, over the Pacific. And after he'd spoken one evening, a, a guy came up to him and uh, said these words. I just want to read them to you. You know, I don't really enjoy these seminars. Look at everyone else here. Look at that beautiful coastline and the sea and out there and all that's happening. But all I can do is sit and worry about the grilling I'm going to get from my wife tonight on the phone. When I come to these seminars in the evening, she gives me the third degree and she does it every time I'm away. What did I have for breakfast? Where did I eat it? Who else was there? Was I in meetings all morning? Did we stop for lunch? What did I do for lunch? How did I spend the afternoon? What did I do for entertainment that evening? Who went with me? What did we talk about? And what she really wants to know but never really quite asks is who can she call to ver verify everything I've told her? She just nags me and questions everything I do whenever I'm away. It has taken all the bloom out of this whole experience. I just don't enjoy it at all. And then the guy paused, and he said this sentence. I guess she knows all the questions to ask. It was at a seminar like this that I met her when I was married to someone else. Trust. Every now and then you'll find a politician and it doesn't seem to be as big a deal as it was five or six presidents ago. But every now and then you'll find a politician running for office of president, and it will be disclosed that he had an affair with someone, and there's a group of people who say he's disqualified. And there's another group of people who say, and by the way, I'm never political. If you're here with me, this isn't about politics, it's about faithfulness and marriage, okay? So I'm not talking, haven't named names or anything, I'm never political from this pulpit. I think that's, I think that's cheapening the pulpit. There is no pulpit, but you get the point, right? Okay. So there's this one group of people that say he's disqualified um, because he had an affair. And there's another group of people that say, and you've heard the line, I'm sure, I didn't hire him to be my husband. I'm voting for him to be my whatever, president, congressman, whatever it is, right? What this group of people are saying, and what is worth consideration, is this: they're saying this. They're saying the most sacred promise he ever made is one he did not keep. How can I trust him with anything else? But <laughs> when you are faithful and honor marriage and you are trustworthy year after year after year after year, people notice that. And people trust you with other things. And you have ministry opportunity, and I think all of us who are believers want ministry opportunity, to speak truth into people's lives and to help them along the path they're walking and to speak with a sense of credi credi credibility because faithfulness, honoring marriage, strengthens relationships. Third, <laughs> honoring marriage keeps your, keeps your heart healthy. I almost said it kept your, never mind, keeps your heart healthy. <laughs> your health hearty too, right? You know, as a pastor, I've talked to a lot of different people about troubles they're having in their life. And uh, I've talked to people who've failed to honor their marriage vows. They've come to me and said, Pastor, I just need help. Or maybe it was the vows of someone else's marriage they entered into and broke those vows. And the regret that they feel in their heart is overwhelming to them and heartbreaking for me to watch. Nobody who knows Christ looks at that and say, I'm glad you feel miserable. It's overwhelming and heartbreaking. They regret what they have done, and their heart is, their heart is not healthy at that point. Their heart is broken at that point. It doesn't always happen. I'm sure there are people who break this command, and I never get to see them because they don't feel any regret, but I would suggest that perhaps their heart wasn't healthy to begin with, right? But here they are. They're talking to their pastor, 
because they have broken this commandment and her heart is not broken, is not healthy, rather. Hmm. Honoring marriage prevents that. Honoring marriage makes your heart healthy. You feel good about your relationship with your spouse. You feel better about your family. You feel good about yourself. You feel good about your spouse personally. And you have done that verse that is so popular today in Proverbs uh, chapter 4, verse 23. It says, above all else, guard your heart, for it is a wellspring of life. This version says everything you do flows from it. Honoring marriage guards your heart so it can be the wellspring of life in your life. Yeah, this is a sensitive topic for some. It can be very painful. I want to kind of circle back to the start. If your spouse has been unfaithful, I understand that remembering this can be sorrowful. And this could be a hard, a hard past 25 minutes for you. Let me say to you once more, never let the sinful behavior of another person define you. Let God define you as a man, as a woman, simply as the human you are, and look to his faithfulness. Others find adultery a sensitive issue because they've committed it. They have been adulterous. Maybe it was full-blown. You'll need to stop. If it's full-blown and you're still in it, you'll need to stop and you need to confess it to God. And then you need to think long and hard about how you will deal with this in your own marriage from this point forward. Maybe it wasn't full-blown. Maybe it was emotional adultery and you know that you crossed the line. You'll need to stop. You'll need to stop and you'll need to think, confess it to God. And you'll need to think carefully about how you might address that in your own life. Maybe it wasn't acted out. It was an affair of the mind. You'll need to stop. And you'll need to take those thoughts captive. You'll need to confess it to God. Whatever the case, when you're ready to address it, and when you are addressing it before God, let me say these words to you. Never let your past define you. Run to the God who is always ready to forgive. Let hope define you and lean hard into the power of the Spirit of God who, if you belong to Jesus, inhabits your very person. Leave your past failings at the cross and walk in the forgiveness and newness of life you've received from Christ. Yeah, <laughs> this is a sensitive topic, but it's an important one. And it's one that I'm glad we've covered. I hope you are too. I would like to pray for you as we conclude our time together. Let's bow our hearts. Comfortable standing, let's stand together. Let's bow our hearts in prayer. Lord Jesus, as we're bowed before you, we recognize uh, that without your grace, we would all be in trouble. Because it is you, Jesus, who says with great clarity <laughs> that even when we look on someone with lust in our heart, we're guilty of adultery. And so we get that. I think specifically right now of of people who might be here that their spouse committed adultery. And maybe they put on this tough veneer like, well, that doesn't hurt me, but they know deep down inside it was hurtful. We pray for your healing action in their lives and that they would never let the sinful behavior of another person define them, but they would let you define them as a man or if they're a woman as a woman simply as a person, that they would look to you and your faithfulness in their life. And I think of those who maybe have crossed the line in a very literal way, or maybe just in, in, in a relational way, or maybe just in their hearts, and they understand your words, Jesus, when you say, when you speak in the Sermon on the Mount. 
I pray that they would turn their hearts toward you and away from darkness and that they would repent and then not let that past define them and that they would always run to you because you were always ready to forgive and that hope would define who they are as they lean on you and the power of your spirit, God, and that they would know that because they belong to you, Jesus, you inhabit them through the Holy Spirit that they would leave their past failings at the cross and they would walk with Christ in forgiveness and newness of life they have received from you, God. I thank you for your gracious forgiveness. I pray for all of us that we would honor marriage. We would honor our own marriage by investing in it, investing in the person we're married to, and that we would honor the marriages of others by respecting them and the promise they made and standing clear of interference with that. I pray that through this, we would find great blessing, the blessing that comes with following you, with knowing you, with obeying you. In Christ's name I pray, amen.
I've asked Bob Lope if he would conclude our time in <coughs> prayer this morning. Mr. Lope. Heavenly Father, it's uh, so good to be in your house this morning and yes. on this beautiful fall day. We ask, Lord, that you would be with us as we leave here. <coughs> help us to take this message with us. And as the last song was sung, the, your name has all the power. And when we are in need of help and, and prayer, let us think of you, Lord Jesus. And we just thank you again for this day. Pray you be with us all as we leave here. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. But your name.